and of life care for everyone actually it, it starts with adults i mean even medicine itself you know it started out with general medicine which is pretty much taking care of adults and then we develop more skills and knowledge base and then people recognize the need for a certain focus on kids and they realize that kids are not small adults and so you have pediatrics after about a few decades and then the process just keeps on repeating you know we have surgery and then suddenly you have pediatric surgery the same goes for end-of-life care hospice and palliative care as a field starts out as the hospice part you know the dying kids and then you kind of sort of extend it earlier and earlier so the kids who might die but are already probably heading there and the kids who might die but might also live but are experiencing a lot of difficulty and suffering and psychosocial reactions because their illness is life-threatening is very severe so that's where we're at but for these sessions we'll focus on the most critical one because even the most critical of hospice and palliative care like taking care of the one dying the hospice part is not well developed in almost every place in the planet so when it got started it's the same thing. So it started out with the adult part and then within a decade, the pediatric part happened. And uh, the reason for this is the same thing. Kids are not small adults. And the idea of the pediatricians also follows. Like, for example, if you're going to use big medications, especially morphine, opioids, or sedatives, you have to take into consideration that the kid has a smaller body than the adult. So that's the reason why you we use the same thing. We're very careful with the weight or the body surface area and, and trying to determine the right and safe starting dose for kids and then the right way of titrating doses for kids, especially if you're dealing with kids who are fairly unstable because, you know, they have a life-threatening, very advanced illness is probably affecting their entire body. On top of that, concern of pediatricians would be it's not just the weights. You're actually concerned about other things like the metabolism of the drug, the liver function, the kidney function. I mean, a small kid's liver is changing as he grows older and the kidneys are changing as he grows older. The metabolism is different. Of course, we don't have answers for all of these, but then the core message is you have to be careful. Now, when we talk about the psychosocial dimension, it's the same thing. The kid is growing. And so a four or five year old would react differently and would have different needs compared to a nine year old or a 12 year old or a 16 year old. It's a growing kid. So what do we do? Well, we're just starting. During the 1980s and 1990s, the, the first thing that you'll see in the workshops to introduce the idea of end of life care for potentially dying kids or kids with life-threatening illnesses or kids who are actually dying, the hospice part or the end-of-life care part for kids would be um, this big table. And when you look at the table, it looks old because it uses Piaget's developmental stages. And, you know, Piaget is like, he's world famous, but, you know, he was also of the 1950s. I mean, he, he was very active mid-20th century, of almost a few decades earlier before the development of family medicine, primary care, modern primary care, and modern end-of-life care. So they looked at his stages and they said, well, you know, it's the pioneering theory. And, and definitely after that, we have a whole bunch of other theories which are much more complex and sophisticated. But the idea is not to turn all these doctors who want to take care of their dying kids into child psychologists and do research on developmental stages that's not the idea the idea is deliver the message that when you're dealing with kids who are dying consider the stage of their life so this simple idea is this the kids as they grow older would develop their thought process their perceptions their judgment their reasoning will be different and so the way they think and the way they react to what's happening to them and the way they see things would be different and therefore, even their emotional reactions and psychosocial reactions would be different. So that's the basic idea. And that's the take-home point when you see these tables and you see one-third of a chapter about the psychosocial adaptation of, or the psychosocial reaction of dying kids. The idea is not to, not to turn you into a child psychologist researcher. Because, you know, if you really want to do that, just then you'd have to take an entire course on that. But the idea is to drive home the message that you have to consider the child's developmental stage. For example, um, of course, some of these things cannot be completely proven, but the idea is that if someone is like, um, you know, like an infant, 
well, he's probably in his mother's womb and then he comes out and then he starts feeling more somatic sensations. There's, there's pain, there's, there's comfort. We don't really know what they're thinking. They don't have any language formation. So the, the way they perceive the world and the way they think would not be verbal. And so we're, we're not too sure. The original idea is maybe they don't have any concept of reality. My suggestion is they probably do have a concept of reality except that their concept of reality is not our adult version of reality or not the understandable version of reality because we do understand somewhat the small child's concept of reality somewhere around maybe like a four-year-old or five-year-old just because we can interact with them at an infancy that's just really not a lot of ways to go about doing things so if we look at an infant and then we say well what do we do well quality of life distress comfort and suffering okay so uh, what would cause the most difficulty for that small infant who just came out of his mom's womb or who's being carried by his mom at home and then suddenly got sick and now is dying well maybe if we take out the mom too much then that will be a cause of suffering if we make the mom take care of the kid a lot carry the kid and still keep on doing what she's doing and the kid hears her mom's voice and his face against the mom's chest and hears the very comforting heartbeat of the mom maybe that's the most comforting thing there is and that probably hopefully would alleviate some of the distress of the kid now about the IV insertions and the needles and, and stuff well it's obvious that the child cries and so he feels the pain he cannot do much about it and in the old days like you know I guess 1950s 1960s nobody really cares we just poke the kid and nowadays um, that's not an advisable thing to do obviously the kid is hurting so you do your best to control the pain of the stuff you're doing especially if the kid is like you know it's only a few weeks or months to live and then you're inflicting pain on the kid half the time i mean you know it's the same idea that's suffering and quality of life except that the kid's not able to tell you and we don't really understand his thought process right now what if he becomes like you know like a small three-year-old or a four-year-old well actually you don't even need to swallow journals and textbooks on child development you know what's a three-year-old or four-year-old doing well he's starting to walk around play around and suddenly his world is much more different he sees stuff when you watch him play you know with his cousins is doing solo play like parallel play they're doing stuff on their own every now and then they interact but not much so it's it's self-centered or egocentric in a way and their visual faculties they're seeing stuff and therefore they're thought process would be very visual their language is already beginning to develop but not much now this is also the time when you know something in their head is making them more prone to magical thinking some of them would have vivid dreams now if they're hurting a lot and something is causing them distress like you know you put them in a hospital you start poking them and mom's not there and things like that then you might have kids experiencing bad dreams and nightmares so that's pretty much what the table says. Of course, that's not all of it. I mean, the table cannot tell you everything, all the possibilities that might happen, all the possible reactions and all the things that you might be able to do to address those reactions. That's just a table. That's just like one half of a page or one page of something that covers several books and journals, right? So you're not an expert. The idea of the table is to help you because you really need to do something. Most kids, you know, they have this idea that, you know, they've seen um, stuff die, but whether they have completely grasped the idea that, you know, when you die, you don't go back to life. Well, that's not true for everyone, especially if you're a small kid. Of course, nowadays, we do understand that kids are more exposed to a lot of information and knowledge. Like, even a five-year-old is already surfing the internet, but the original stage theory says, you know, maybe the four-year-old... You know, they probably or most of them would think that death is reversible you know you, you sleep and you look like sleeping uh, the dead person looks like he, he's sleeping and so when he's familiar with sleep so just like sleeping you'll probably wake up so what do you do well the comfort thing is still almost the same as the infant uh, the most basic stuff is you know if you have a three or four year old then you would take away the parent or especially the mom who's been taking care of the kid especially if he has problems he fell and is a boo-boo or he's hurting and you take away the mom and he's, he's experiencing a very distressing experience at home or in the hospital that wouldn't be such a very comforting thing so you don't separate the mom from the kid 
now uh, a slightly older kid would be like four or five also it experienced the idea that you know you, you did something to the other kid and then the kid started crying and, and it turned out to be a bad thing and you, you caused it and so this this idea that some kids would think that they're responsible for their siblings illness like they did something bad and now that their brother or their sister is in the hospital very sick and it's probably connected to what they did and then they try to recall the stuff that they did and so there's this the guilt now for us adults uh, parents and uh, the doctors and it's a very stupid thing i mean you know you're stealing your sibling's toy did not cause the cancer. So what should we do? Well, we can say, well, that's a stupid thing. Let's not pay attention to it. It's just a small kid. Now, the suggestion is that's not the right thing to do because as far as this small child is concerned, the guilt and the distress is very real. He really thinks he did it. And now his sibling is there in the hospital, very sick, looks very uncomfortable. And it's a very scary situation. And he thinks he's the one who did it. Or it might not be a sibling. It might be what's happening to them. You know, they did something wrong and now this is a punishment. And where did that come from? Well, that happens to you. You did something wrong and then the parents punish you because, you know, you, you have to get disciplined. And maybe you being sick and then your parents bringing you to the hospital and the other old people uh, who are talking to your parents are doing stuff to you. It feels like it's painful and it's distressing and you know it's like a you know face the corner kind of thing. You're in a different environment. Maybe it's a punishment. Maybe it's a punishment, right? So it's like it feels like a face the corner kind of situation. Except that you're not just in a corner. You're in a different scary place, and then people are doing painful stuff to you. Maybe it's something bad that you did. Now, now you're sick, and then we'll say, well, that's a very stupid thing. This let's not pay attention to it. It's just a small kid. But the suggestion is, you know. As far as that small kid is concerned, that distress, that, that emotional distress, that guilt is very, very real. Okay? Uh, and you'll notice also that the reaction of the five-year-old is already reacting to the situation. The, the very, very small infant, you know, it's, he's in a crib, he doesn't really know what the place looks like, except that, you know, the, the bed feels like this and mom's not around or mom's carrying him or her and it feels better and they're sticking something on his arm and it's painful but once you're slightly bigger and then you see that it's this is not your house and the situation is different so you're reacting to the situation you know you're not in your house how come you're not in your house how come my mom is the only one that's here how come i'm not at home how come i'm not in school how come i cannot play with my siblings how come they're doing this this doesn't feel good if you're attending kindergarten and suddenly you're not attending nursery or kinder and there's no kids around and all the kids around you are, are sick if you're in a, a general ward and there's no walls and uh, yeah um those places still exist and you can just imagine what happens to kids if they see very sick kids across the ward and uh, a lot of crying kids and i'm guessing it's very traumatic but hopefully we don't uh, they had those kinds of wars in the old hospitals 1960s 1970s even in the united states or canada or the uk but hopefully we don't have too much of those nowadays even adults if you're a dying adult and then you know you're dying and then you're you're beside a very sick person and this sick person starts coding and then you know throwing up blood or getting the cpr and then they put a curtain in between you but you know you're not stupid you know what's happening beside you and suddenly uh, what comes out is someone who's all wrapped up and obviously dead and they don't need to tell you that it's so obvious what does that do to you psycho-emotionally or psychosocially? Knowing that you also have a severe illness and you're just as sick as that person, right? If that's difficult, what about a child who sees that? Anyway, we won't go into that because uh, that's not the topic right now. Now, the, the four or five-year-old's idea of reversible death, you know, you're sleeping and then you wake up, well, probably like a three, three-year-old. Now, obviously, the idea of a three-year-old that a dead person looks like a sleeping person probably would wake up as he gets older would become the actual thing you know he realizes that you don't wake up and once you die you don't get seen again and then the next thing that develops is you know people die but i don't die or my family doesn't die because it's other people we're seeing you know unless somebody in the household dies so at some point as you get older you you might get to see some old person die and then or you start watching internet or youtube or movies and then you see that you and or your sibling or your parents can also die and then of course you get scared now if your sibling is in the hospital and you're old enough you're not a three-year-old that might result in fear you know your sibling is there very sick you can get sick yourself right 
your mom can get sick also. Now you're scared. And that's a very real psycho-emotional distressing reaction, right? And who's going to address that? Well, the people taking care of the family, the sick child, and hopefully they pay attention to the sibling of the sick child and the parents or the adults of the family. You know, they kind of try to figure things out and work together. Now, you have to do that because the table is not going to tell you exactly what to do. It just gives you an idea that this is the case. You have to consider that the child is developing. This is how he can grasp things. It changes. But it doesn't really tell you what's happening to the child. I mean, it is such a complex thing. The only way to figure it out is just talk to the people who know the child or the sibling. And who would that be? Well, the adults who have been raising the child and the other uh, old people or the other adults in the house. And then you kind of talk about it and then you supply the theory and the general ideas, you know. Most siblings would have these kinds of issues, one, two, three, four, five, what do you think? Or, or most kids who are very sick in the hospital, this is usually what they go through. And uh, it can manifest as this, what do you think? Or what are your other concerns? It obviously won't hit every concern. And not all kids would act out the table of your one little chapter on psychosocial reaction of kids to severe disease or life-limiting disease. You know, it's not a script. So now, what about the, uh, like a, a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old? Well, the brain is developing. He's probably thinking more and working with toys. He's going to school. He's learning more language. Not just language, he's working with objects. And so his brain is developing. But it's not completely abstract thinking yet. The, the abstract thinking, that's the hardest thing to grasp because it's like concepts verbal concepts and ideas so he's beginning to do that but it's not there yet so it's more concrete thinking and so the active mind of the child well at this point is probably more concerned about those things that he can he's trying to understand like you know why am i here why, what what are you doing what what's that liquid you're you're giving me how come it's painful why is it what's the cancer if you give a seven-year-old and eight-year-old internet connection in google then They'll ask you more and they're actually going to be a lot smarter there. Actually, I think kids nowadays are much, much smarter and more intelligent than we were when we were kids a few decades ago. And probably the abstract thinking starts earlier. Of course, they're not like a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old thinking about existential stuff and about life and death and what is this. You might hear them say it, but of course, the thought process and what's happening in their brain is not yet completely developed or not yet the adult, matured kind of abstract, existential, spiritual, religious, life and death kind of thinking. And so how do you address this? Well, you know, his reaction would be, so he'll be asking a lot of questions and he needs more explanation. It's not just putting the mom close to the kid and giving a simple explanation about, you know, you're sick and we're, we're giving you stuff to help your body get better. Or you might even invent a story for the small kid, like a five-year-old. You know, your leukemic cells or your cancer cells are like, you know, the, the bad soldiers in your body that's causing problems. And you have your um, good soldiers inside your body. Of course, you're referring to the immune system and the immune cells and the cells of your immune system. And then the medication we're giving you, the reason why you're, you're throwing up is it's very strong. It's like a bazooka. So it helps your good soldiers, and then if your good soldiers are winning, then you will feel better, and you'll be less sick, and you can get out of the hospital. And then of course, the kid will say, well, just, okay, that's fine, I, I, I get it, give me the bazooka. You know, it feels bad, but the reason why it feels bad is pretty strong. Now, it's not the complete scientific version of the story, but it's pretty accurate. You know, it, it's the stuff that helps your body, and that's all the small kid needs, so that he's not confused and distressed. Why? The adults and his parents are giving him that drug that's making him feel sicker, right? Now, of course, that's not going to work for a nine-year-old. You have to be more concrete than that. And he, he is beginning to ask more. So that's how PJ's stage theory works. You know, that's the reason why it's being presented in the, you know, in one-third of the workshop or the one-third of the module or one-third of the uh, textbook chapter on the psych social reaction of the kid to death and dying and severe illness if the kid's 
not about to die and the kid still has like six to eight months to live or even one year to live but definitely not curable and with a progressive illness that will ultimately kill the child sometimes they get sent back to school and, and the question is why would you do that that's a stupid thing they won't even reach high school why would you do that why do we send the kid to school because it provides the kid with a puts the kid in a, a more familiar non-distressing situation now you bring him back to the familiar nursery school and you know it's the nice place nice classroom and there's his classmates and you know that's probably going to do much more than your feeble attempt hoping that you know the antidepressant that you use for adults would work on this small kid and uh, i can tell you probably it's not going to work because it's not a simple depression anymore you know those things are great you know if you're dealing with like an employee in a very highly stressful environment and having difficulty emotionally and it kept on progressing and is depressed and you gave her or him the depression pill with or without counseling that that kind of works and that's really why they became popular for those kinds of things but you're not dealing with that you're dealing with a small kid with a terminal illness that's the different thing you can't even assess the kid well you know the assessment can't even figure out if this is the kind of thing that you should be doing and what to expect out of the pill now of course right now we sort of try to depend on the pills and medications even if we are not sure if they're going to work actually we try to convince ourselves that it's going to work because we'd rather not do the dirty work of sitting down talking to the kid and trying to figure things out you know doctors like the easy swallow the pill it will work 70 percent of the time kind of thing but you know the suggestion is you're not dealing with that but you have to do something so anyway you you bring the child to school so you prepare the child you prepare the you don't subject the classmates to a very sick looking or thin looking child and then the child interacts with the classmates and suddenly he's absent and suddenly he's dead so you have to make sure that that didn't cause any distress to the classmates right so you have to make sure that the teacher who's not really well trained to deal with those situations is well prepared maybe you can set up a special kind of school for for that or maybe you can set up a sort of normal familiar environment in a home school setting with classmates visiting your child every now and then the idea is to bring a sense of normality but you know that's a different topic we're going way beyond what's intended for this little talk now of course we haven't even talked about the siblings in great detail you know sometimes the siblings have been missing their their brother or this sister who's been in the hospital very sick for like the past two to three months and they're wondering they're concerned and the adults talked about it and they think that it might be a good idea to bring the child to visit the sick sister or brother inside the hospital unfortunately the sick sister and brother is attached to all sorts of things and so you have to plan things out and that's a very complicated process but sometimes you need to do it because it does more good than harm sometimes you don't need to do it because it does more harm than good but that's an altogether different topic and we won't go into that and of course when you hit 11 12 especially 15 and 16 pretty much very near adult stages so you're now you're dealing with the capacity to think in terms of concepts abstract ideas existential issues almost like you you know probably 16 year old right now would think almost the same as any other adult the only thing that's lacking is you know they haven't experienced much in life so that's the only thing that's lacking they're still in high school or early college but they're getting there they're almost there so you're already encountering thoughts about what is life what is death life is so unfair it doesn't mean anything was the sense of it all and so the common adult issues of lack of meaning search for meaning um, sense of hope hopelessness which cause significant suffering it's a different kind of suffering it's not the kind of suffering we doctors like taking care of because you know it's easy to do physical biological kind of symptom management you're throwing up we give you something to make you throw up less or you're fearful we give you a drug to kind of you know make you fall asleep or sedate you or you're in pain we give you a strong pain medication and the pain goes up it's it, that's the easy part now the existential what, what do you do with that uh, med school nowadays is becoming less and less psychosocial and that's not even psychosocial that's like a few steps beyond psychosocial so we're not too familiar with those but the suggestion is you're dealing with a pre-adolescent or adolescent who's facing severe illness and who probably knows that he might die and who has a good grasp of what death is and is already thinking about life, death, what comes after death, if there is any. And those thoughts are probably causing significant difficulties, uh, existential, psycho-emotional, and even relational. So there's no way you not address those, even if you don't know as much as you know about 
pain fibers and mechanism of actions of your opioids and receptors even if you don't know that much and i would guess there's no way of knowing things as exactly as that because you know i mean they're they're very hard to pin down like it's so easy to randomize people and then you know you're feeling this and then we give you this pain medication a and this pain medication b and you you take the sugar pill and then you we see what happens and use um, statistics and then you know that's your evidence it doesn't work too well if you're dealing with something so complex as uh, emotions and psychosocial problems especially um, existential issues and abstract issues now the other problem is some doctors have begun to think modern doctors have begun to think that you know those emotions and relations and existential issues are not their concern i mean it's a major issue as far as the sick child is concerned and allegedly uh, the doctors are the main carers except that these main carers don't think it's their job so that's the problem of modern medicine right now but that's not the topic so we won't go too much into that uh, so what do you do my first suggestion is don't do something like this don't say well you know it's such a complicated thing and you know even the table contains child psychology they don't teach us that in med school or in uh, residency and so it's not my problem the hospital should hire a whole bunch of people to do that now, you shouldn't do that because if you think that way then most of the time what will happen is nobody's going to do it because there's not a lot of resources for those kinds of things now the the things you read in journals well those are the well resourced centers in fairly rich developed countries but you're not there right so if you don't do it then the child suffers because nobody wants to do it what just happened is you found yourselves an excuse not to do it and that's not the original message of pediatric hospice care the, the original message is a child who has a severe life li- limiting illness and and or who's actually dying has these kinds of needs and whoever you are or whoever you all are maybe your doctor or nurse or even if you're such a small group and that's all the healthcare system of your country or your hospital or institution can muster have to pay attention to that and have to do your best together with the help of the parents and the adults of the family to take care of that that's the message so saying that well you know it's not my fault we don't have the child life therapist and the child psychologist and obviously this pj and this all i know about pj so that's just an excuse and that's not the idea okay so unfortunately things tend to get lost in translation if the original intent and the values get corrupted just like what's happening in many places in modern medicine so the the psychosocial team or psychosocial personnel would be great do your best to get help for that but more than likely even if you do get that it will be very limited and you have to do stuff on your own it's very very possible if you're not in a very well resourced very rich country you won't have that kind of personnel or even if you have that one person or that one person is probably taking off a gazillion patients inside the hospital and it's not going to work right so you have to learn to do it because it's unfair for the suffering dying kid if you're just trying to excuse yourself out of it right same goes for referring to hospice you know hospice is also like an excuse you know well we refer to hospice and they're supposed to be doing it but you know that your hospital is not supporting hospice too well and hospice only has these many personnel well it's not our fault anymore that they cannot do it we just refer to them no you know the limitation you are in close contact with the kid you're the main care provider right you've been taking care of this kid ever since he got sick and you were attempting to cure him or stabilize him unfortunately it's not working it's still your responsibility to do as much as you can that's the message now of course that's not the kind of message that a lot of doctors would want to hear because you know it's an additional work you don't get paid for it but you didn't become a doctor just to get paid just for the lifestyle just for the fancy cars and the fancy hotel conferences that's not the reason why you chose this profession right so if you have a dying person or a dying small person like a kid and and whatever you did didn't work because you're not god obviously i mean kids will die under your care because you're their doctor if they're suffering if they're hurting if they're emotionally reacting to their disease you have to do something about it the parents have to do something about it you have to do something about it right so if you're the nurse you also have to do something about it you work together you don't look for excuses not to do it now the situation is so complex it cannot be obtained 
in a one-shot deal. All clinical psychologists or child psychologists will tell you that. You don't sit down, meet with the parents, and try to figure it out in half an hour or one hour and then come up with a plan that you'll carry out for the next several weeks until the patient dies. That's not how it works. Even for simpler problems not related to a lot of suffering and distress and, and attacks on the child's sense of normalcy or situations that uh, really cause significant psychosocial distress to the child, it takes more than just a one hour or two hour, uh, one to two time meeting with the parents to figure things out. It's a, an ongoing process. You know, you, you do this, you plan this out, you share notes, ask the parents what's happening, and then you come up with that, that's how it works. Especially if you're dealing with a very complex, very difficult situation. You know, you're not just dealing with a sore throat or a child with pneumonia. You're dealing with someone with a cancer or a severe heart problem or a liver problem that's progressively worsening, causing a lot of physical, emotional, and other kinds of suffering and discomfort to the child. Now, on top of that, you're dealing with a parent who's also distressed and emotional. So that's the other part of the very complicated situation. You also have to help them out. They cannot help you out if you don't help them out. Yeah, that's their kid. I mean, it's, it's not like they're pathological. You know, any parent with a kid who's dying or who might die will feel distressed. But they're your main source of help, your main partners as far as helping this child or supporting this child psycho-emotionally is concerned, right? So you have to help them out. And of course, when I say those things, the reaction is, that's so difficult. You know, I, I have to think about, I have to memorize the mechanism of action, the clinical trials for these kinds of end-stage disease processes. I have to do, figure that one out and memorize it. And, you know, our med school or residency didn't teach us a lot about psychosocial or counseling or communication or therapy stuff. You know, we really need someone else to do it and I won't do it. I can't do it. You know, I might do something wrong. Well, if you don't do anything, that's even more wrong than doing something, right? You know, the simplest way to think about things is what if it's your kid? How would you want the doctor to treat your child? What if it's your kid and you're not a doctor? You want to help your kid psycho socially or emotionally, but you don't really know. And the closest person to ask would be the doctor who's been with you during the child's um, illness journey or disease process who's been trying to help you out and has been your source of hope before. And then you ask the doctor, how would you feel if the doctor says, well, you know, I'm not trained for that. Sorry, we, I can't do that. And you're on your own. So is that the right answer? Obviously not. Three to five years of college plus another three to eight years of advanced training and years of experience dealing with illness and sickness and dying probably you're capable of looking for information and ways to help out the mom. You probably are capable of coming up with good advice to help the mom out, right? So, I mean, it's a lifelong learning process. And if you chose a field of work that involves a lot of dying kids, well, you have to learn it. You don't just say, I can't do that, you know, and then go about wasting your time doing all sorts of stuff, like, you know, going on a shopping spree in Europe and attending conferences and forgetting about because, you know, you don't need to waste your time trying to learn something that you think you're not responsible for. Well, my suggestion is you are responsible for it because you're the child's doctor. Now, the psychosocial difficulty of the parents of the very sick kid or the dying kid might also cause a different kind of problem for you. Usually, you don't want to think about it. You want to convince yourself that things are not the way they are. Unfortunately, the thing that would remind you that things are the way they are is some doctor or psychosocial support person to sit down and talk about it. Now, obviously, you need that because you need to prepare yourself. You need to take care of your kid. You need to help your kid out. You know, you cannot be in denial for a very long time. I mean, it works to calm yourself down, but it doesn't work if that's the only thing you keep on using all the way until your child's death, right? That would cause a significant problem as far as the child's siblings, you, yourself, and everyone else because you're not functional. You're just trying to convince yourself that you'd rather stay in this idea that's not true, right? So so you, you if you're the healthcare team or the doctor or the hospice person, you might find parents unwilling to talk to you or talk about those kinds of things. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, how do you deal with that is to be honest, to recognize it, then to sit down and tell them um, that you understand how they're feeling, but you tell them that, you know, it's also good to talk about these things because they can do a lot as far as taking care of the child and helping the child and helping the child's siblings if we become more open and so that we can plan things out. 
it's difficult, but then we're the adults, you're the parents, and we're the doctors and the nurses of your child. We have to do the difficult stuff.